If you have a Bible, you can open it up to Revelation chapter 2 this morning. I just read our key passage, and that's really our only passage for the morning. And we're in week two of a series entitled Timeless, How the Eternal Church is Greater Than Shifting Culture. And what we're doing in this series is examining the seven letters written to the seven churches. I thought it was timely, or interesting at least, that on the very week that we kicked off this series, that there was a headline in the New York Times, not a small publication, that said something to the effect of the Pope shifts on long-standing policy in the church. A week into our series on the eternal church is greater than shifting culture. We're not just talking about the shift in culture. We've also been in this talking about how it is the church's job to proclaim an eternal gospel as an eternal church, talking about an eternal God, that there can be a shift within the confines of the church as well, but it is our job to not shift, to hold on to biblical values, to stand for truth, and to proclaim it, this eternal gospel. And so that's our role. That's what we believe we've been called to do. And so we're studying these letters uh, to see what it is that Jesus wanted his church to know in the midst of shifting culture. Last week, we kicked it off in the letter to the Ephesians uh, with principle or truth, timeless truth, number one, that where all of this has to start, where all of this has to start is a deep love for Jesus, a deep love for Christ. Said another way, it starts by being just rooted in the gospel, reminding ourselves that we can do all of the right things, but in doing all of the right things, if we just simply forget a love for Jesus, not even doing all of the right things is enough. Jesus looks at the church at Ephesus and says, you're doing all of these good things, but you have forgotten your love for me. And if you don't get it back, I'm going to remove your lampstand. I'm shutting this thing down. And so we're rooted first in a love for Jesus. Today, we look at the second letter to the church in Smyrna. Smyrna is a church of, uh, I'm sorry, a city of about 200,000 people, a fluent city. Uh, It was the center of emperor worship um, for that particular Roman province. And so every year, uh, every citizen in Smyrna would have to worship the emperor. And the way that they would do that uh, is through incense. Smyrna actually means myrrh. And so through incense, they would worship the emperor uh, and every citizen uh, of, the, of the city would have to do this. Now, if you didn't do this, it meant three things, at least three things. You didn't get to vote. You couldn't purchase property and you couldn't trade in the marketplace. So you lost three things, your political power, your social standing, and your economic abilities. And so in the church in Smyrna, to be a Christian meant, there goes your politics, (laughs) your job, and your social standing. It's why Jesus writes into the church and says, I know these things. I know your tribulation. But tribulation, he most probably meant what I just explained. That leads into their poverty. Of course, they were impoverished. They couldn't trade in the marketplace and they couldn't own property. And then thirdly, he says he knows the slander that they've been facing, the the things that people have been saying about them, the the slander that has been part of their suffering. And so in this early part of the letter, we see three types of, uh, three things that Jesus points out to them, right? Their their poverty, their, uh, their, their, the slander that they're facing, and this tribulation. Now, it's at least interesting to acknowledge that to be a Christian in Smyrna almost means the complete opposite of what it has meant to be a Christian in America over the last 200 or so years, Right? Like in America, for the most part, over the last 200 or so years, to be a Christian um, was like there was voting capital in that. To be a Christian uh, meant actually like financial success. Uh, To be a Christian actually gave you social standing. I mean, for the most part in the history of our church, being a Christian has been highly advantageous economically, socially, and politically. And in Smyrna, it is the complete opposite. Smyrna Smyrna, is also one of the only two churches in the seven letters that nothing negative is said about. 
It's not because they were perfect. It's just that Jesus looked in and and apparently anything that was negative wasn't worth mentioning. Throughout the letters, it's interesting that the more suffering the church is facing, the less negative Jesus tends to say to that church. The greater the prosperity of the church, the harsher the words Jesus has for them. You get to Laodicea, which many scholars believe that these seven letters are actually the seven series or seasons of the church as a whole. And when you get to the seventh letter of Laodicea, it says the complete opposite. Uh, Then Smyrna and Smyrna, they knew their poverty. In Laodicea, they knew their riches. And to that church, Jesus says, and I want to spit you out of my mouth. There's something for us to learn here in this letter a letter that really is about suffering. Jesus says, I know what you are facing to this church. Before I get into what he does say, let's just acknowledge quickly what Jesus does not say. Jesus does not say, and I'm going to stop it. Jesus does not say, now pray against it. Now, in fact, if you're going to summarize Jesus' words on what he speaks to them in the midst of this, uh, if I was going to summarize it in a line, it would be, I know what you're facing, and it's going to get worse. That's, in essence, Jesus' statement to this group. I know what you're facing. It's going to get worse. There's something about this particular letter that makes us stop and ask, how willing to be faithful am I? How committed to this gospel am I? What would make me give it up? What would make me abandon it? And we'll see in this letter what it would be be true, or what should be true for each of us. So in verse 10, let me just read verse 10 because we're gonna pull three things out of it. He says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and for 10 days you have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Three things that Jesus says to the church in the midst of, of their suffering. Remember, their suffering is the tribulation, all of that power that they lost, their poverty, and the slander that they are facing. The uh, three things then that Jesus says to them. The first is this, don't fear it. Don't be afraid of the suffering. Don't let it overcome you. Don't let it overwhelm you. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. And maybe you stop and you go, well, who is Jesus to say anything about suffering? Well, he was called the suffering servant. Jesus knew something about suffering. He knew much more about suffering, in fact, than anybody else, for he faced a greater suffering. So how is it that Jesus can look and say, do not fear what you are about to suffer? First, he can say that because Jesus faced suffering. He faced it. He faced a greater tribulation than even what they would face or even what uh, people face now uh, in other parts of the world or anything that we might ever face. We have a savior and a king who has faced suffering. We're told in Hebrews that he has experienced that in part so that he might relate to us in our suffering. And so we have a, a Jesus who can look and say, don't fear it. I have faced it. You don't need to fear it. I know what you're going through. And he can relate to us in all of our suffering because he's faced it. And so if you're facing suffering, so too has your savior. He is not just a God in the sky. He was God come down to earth as a man who faced suffering for you. But Jesus didn't just Face, uh, face suffering. Jesus can also say, do not fear suffering because Jesus withstood suffering. 
It, 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 didn't, it didn't cripple him. Uh, it, it didn't stop him. It, it didn't cause him to not be faithful. And so how was it that J, uh, Jesus withstood suffering? Not just face it, right? Many people can face suffering and can crumble underneath it, but Jesus didn't just uh, uh, face it. He withstood it. How? How did he do that? The first way he did it is by submitting his will. You and I can never withstand suffering the way that we're supposed to unless we submit our own wills. And so in the midst, uh, or I would say on the onset of his suffering, uh, Jesus has already kind of begun the process of his um, increased suffering. And as he's doing that, uh, he does, as we've all seen, that famous prayer, uh, God, if there be any other way. And then when he realizes in prayer that there isn't, he submits his will. And Jesus now is looking at the church in Smyrna and he's saying, uh, apparently for them, there is no other way. You're going to go through this suffering. By the way, if you have um, um, caught, been caught up in any modern lie or heresy that the Christian life means there is no suffering, you are sadly mistaken. Jesus himself said it and told us that there will be suffering. In fact, we're told that to, to experience suffering is to be like Jesus, which uh, then makes us probably ask the question, if I never experience any type of suffering from my relationship with Christ, am I like Jesus? So Jesus can say, do not fear, because he, with, he, he withstood suffering and he did it by submitting his will. If you want to withstand suffering, you will have to go through the, the crucifix that Christ did of, of submitting your will. Jesus knew the plan. He knew that the plan was he had to go to the cross and he wasn't gonna change God's plan. And we have to realize that sometimes the plan is for us to be who we're supposed to be is to go through suffering and to submit our will in the process of it. Secondly, though, the reason Jesus could withstand suffering is because he saw to the other side. He saw to the other side of it. With joy, he went to the cross because he knew that there was something more beautiful on the other side of suffering than even how horrible it was going through it. He could see to the other side. What was it? Well, it was first and primarily Jesus knew that obedience to his heavenly father um, was more beautiful than the, the, the pain or the anguish of suffering. But Jesus also knew that the redemption of our souls and the redemption of the world was, was worth facing suffering. So how do we withstand suffering? By seeing through to the other side. By seeing that on the other side of suffering, uh, something exists more beautiful than what we experience right now. There's something on the other side of that suffering that, that evens out the scale. Now, that might be eternity in some cases. It might mean something on this earth in other cases. I'll explore that a little bit more. Jesus can look at this church and he can look at the Christian and say, don't fear what you're about to suffer because he faced suffering and because he withstood it. He didn't crumble underneath its pressure. But the third reason Jesus can say, do not fear suffering is because he was also victorious over it. And he, know that he knew that his victory over suffering was not just a cosmic example of how to overcome suffering. He knew that his victory over suffering was actually your power to overcome suffering as well. Like we just sang it. Like, and sometimes this gets polluted in church when, when we go, yes, uh, uh, Jesus is a great example of how to endure suffering. He's not just an example. He's actually the power for you to walk through it. And so you have something in that power, that resurrection power to get you through it which means you can face suffering like Christ did and know that he relates to you. You can withstand suffering by submitting your will and seeing to the other side, but you can also be victorious over suffering because of Christ in you. So when slander comes your way, when you face worldly despair because of your faith in Christ, when you face tribulation, a loss of status or standing or what it may be in Christ. You can endure it. 
and walk through it. Now, the second thing, the second thing that Jesus says to this church, he tells us where the suffering comes from. He says, behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Can I tell you something? The devil loves prison. He loves it. All over the scriptures, <laughs> the devil loves prison. I'll point out a couple of examples to you. Oh, you know what's also great, though? At the end of times in Revelation, you know where the devil ends up? In prison. And so his tactic all throughout the scriptures is to throw people into prison. And then at the end of it, Jesus looks at him and throws him into prison. He tells us where the suffering comes from. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Now, this opens up a conversation that we can't fully answer today on how a sovereign God is over all things, yet suffering still happens to his people. And certainly a part of that answer is, yes, God is sovereign over all, um, but the devil has a certain level of authority, um, a certain level of control and uh, influence over this world. He is called at one place the power of this world. And so here, Jesus is saying, particularly to this church, let me tell you where this suffering is coming from. It's coming from the devil. It's coming from Satan. Let me say it this way. The devil uses suffering as a strategy to destroy. Woo! The devil... <laughs> If things start falling from the ceiling, we'll just keep praying. All right. The devil uses suffering as a strategy to destroy you. The devil uses suffering as a strategy to destroy you. The obvious human example of this is Job in the scriptures. And we look at that and, and, and the devil threw everything at Job to try to get him to abandon faith. And in smaller ways, probably, the devil will use it. But let me redeem this. The devil uses suffering as a strategy to destroy you. God uses suffering as a strategy to deploy you. So the devil looks and he says, if I get this suffering into this person's life, the faith will run out and I'll destroy them. And God looks up and knows if they walk through this suffering, then I'm going to send them on to something greater. <clears throat> Friend, that means when you face slander, Satan wants to use it to get you to run and hide, and God is going to use it to deploy you to whatever is next for you. It means when something of this world is taken from you because of your faith in Christ, Satan wants you to go, I guess God has abandoned me, and God is saying, oh, wait and see what I have for you, okay? Okay. This story is consistent, by the way, all throughout the scriptures. And um, one of the early signs, I told you earlier, Satan loves prison. He loves prison. That's why when Jesus got up and gave his proclamation, he said, I have come to set the captives free. In other words, I have come to undo the work that Satan has done, putting people and binding them in prison. I'm coming to reverse that work. But this um, idea of Satan loving prison, man, it starts all the way back in Genesis. Like this isn't just a New Testament principle. In Genesis, there's this guy by the name of Joseph. And Joseph um, experiences three things. You know what he experiences? He experiences being stripped of his social standing. He experiences being stripped of his earthly goods. And then he is slandered about I wish I could get into all of this, but Joseph is actually simultaneously a picture of Jesus and the church at the same time. 
Those three things happen to Joseph. The last one, after he's stripped of his um, earthly political privileges, he's um, um, stripped, he's sent into slavery, right? He loses his standing. And then he's slandered about and he's thrown into what? Into prison. And then as you continue to read the story, it was Satan's strategy to destroy Joseph. And it's Joseph is the one who tells us that. And it's written into the scriptures, what you meant for evil, God turned for good. And then there's a um, New Testament equivalent of that in Romans chapter eight, which says that he will work out all things together for your good. These are basically mere verses, right? Just in different covenants. And Joseph looks up and he says, listen, what, what, what you meant for evil, what Satan wanted to use to destroy me, God has used it to deploy me. And so uh, Joseph walks through all of this suffering and he's stuck in prison and he's there for a very long time. And at the very end of his prison sentence, he is then deployed to being put in second in command of the, really the entire world or the most powerful part of the world. And many of you know this story. In that moment, then, Joseph's brothers are experiencing a famine in their land, and they come to Egypt, where Joseph has been highly promoted. And Joseph looks out, and he sees his brothers, and his brothers are now in great need. They have no provision, and they have no standing because they're foreigners in this country to demand anything. And in the midst of that, Joseph now, the one who has endured the suffering, has been deployed to a position where he can now offer them exactly what they need. Now, this is later going to be mirrored by Jesus, who's going to endure suffering, who's going to be promoted to the right hand of the Father, second in command, right? Just like Joseph was promoted. And then what's Jesus going to do? He's going to look at his brothers who rejected him on this earth and give them all the provision that they needed. And what was the pathway to being in that position? Suffering. Suffering. Suffering for Joseph. Suffering for Jesus. And I think what we're being taught here in Smyrna is that one of the pathways to gospel impact is through suffering. And even for his church. So Jesus tells the church, don't be afraid of this suffering. The devil's the one who's behind it. This isn't particularly in the text, but I'll say in parentheses, God's saying, but I've got a plan. And then he says this third thing. He says, be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. This one may be hard as a modern reader to, to grasp, but I bet for John, who was there on the day that Jesus died, immediately filled in the blanks and said, be faithful unto death, just as he was, just as you were, Jesus, just as you didn't abandon the suffering, just as you went through the suffering instead of going around it. Just as you, Jesus, were faithful unto death. What does it mean to be faithful unto death? It means that when you're facing the slander, you don't slander back. What does it mean to be faithful in the midst of suffering? It means that when you um, are stripped of um, power or rights or economic standing or whatever it might be because of your faith, you don't give into the idea that, that, that it is somehow like God punishing you or God has abandoned you or God has forgotten you. According to this text, I think it would also mean that it doesn't mean you lash back out. It means you faithfully endure trusting him. Be faithful unto death is, means to, to not abandon Christ regardless of how much the pressure is turned up to do so. Be faithful unto death. Now, how is it that the Christian can be faithful unto death? Um, ultimately, only by looking to Christ and seeing how he was faithful unto death and drawing from that resurrection power. That's the source of it. Um, but also the Christian is faithful unto death because the Christian knows some things. We, we know these things from what we see with Jesus on the cross. And we also know these things because of uh, um, what we see in the rest of the scriptures. 
And scripture teaches us this about suffering. One, that suffering is part of our sanctification process. Let me say it this way. Suffering is the shortest path to sanctification. Success is the slowest path to sanctification. Suffering is the, is the shortest path to sanctification when it has its full effect. And so for the, the Christian, one of the reasons we're, we're faithful unto death, because if we have the love for Jesus that we talked about last week, we see how the suffering, whatever form it might take, is somehow uh, um, um, sanctifying us into being more like Jesus, which is ultimately what we should all desire. Secondly, we as Christians can know this about suffering, that suffering is actually gospel advancing. That as Joseph was elevated to the place a second in, in the throne, second in control, as he was deployed into that spot, he was deployed there. Why? So that the tribe would be preserved so that Jesus might be able to come. Suffering is gospel advancing. Jesus himself said, I have to face the cross so that the Holy Spirit might come. Suffering is gospel advancing. Paul gets thrown into prison, and what does he say? He says, they think this is going to stop the spread of the gospel. Let me tell you what's actually happening. The gospel is on the move. The Christian can take on suffering and be faithful unto death because they know this is advancing the gospel. Are you facing suffering right now? God is going to use this to advance his gospel. He's already using it to sanctify your character. Then he's going to use it to advance his gospel. The third thing suffering does is it positions you, or the word I used earlier, deploys you into exactly the right spot to be more effective. Suffering has this way of when we go through it, when we, when we go through the crucifix of suffering, the, that on the other side of that suffering, we, we, we are in this place then, positioned perfectly for what God wants to do next. And so one of the, the mindsets for the Christian in the midst of suffering is to just be faithful because they know on the other side, God, you're going to strategically deploy me to the right spot at the right time to do the right thing for the right person. And so whereas you think your suffering is all about you, God actually takes your suffering and he makes it all about everyone else. Now, I know your suffering feels like it's all about you and there's certainly a part of it that feels very personal. But what God wants to do through that suffering is for everyone else and his kingdom. Fourthly, why faithful unto death? There is an intimacy. There is an intimacy in suffering that no other portion of our Christian life will bring. There is a connection to Jesus in suffering that success, prosperity, easiness, will never bring. You know this to be true if you have faced suffering. You've heard people say, yeah, there's something about that horrible season that, um, that I certainly don't miss, but there is one thing I miss. There is a closeness to Jesus in that moment that I've just never felt. Suffering has this way. Why? By the way, why? Why? Because Christ was most being Christ in his suffering. If I can say it that way. 
and in suffering than we relate most to Christ. And there's an intimacy there. By the way, one of the reasons we preach expositorily here is because it means then that I can't skip over topics like suffering. When the text says to teach on it, you just have to teach on it. Let me take a couple steps back to about, I don't know what, whenever it was, a third through the sermon. When I just said, there's something about this text that makes you stop and say, how committed am I to this gospel? How committed are you to this gospel? Would a stripping of your right make you abandon it? Would things not going the way you perfectly planned make you run away? Or can you see that in the midst of suffering that might come, Jesus wants to do both something in you and through you that a lack of suffering could never do. This should reposition for us, Christ follower, every difficult thing we face. Let's pray. My Father, I can trust that through your Holy Spirit, you can speak the right words of challenge and encouragement to each person in this room. And Father, I have enough faith to believe that there are people in this room who are getting so close to being on the other side of suffering and being deployed for their greatest impact ever. And my plea is that through your Holy Spirit, you would help them to be faithful unto death. That as the enemy ramps it up, as they feel like their strength begins to fall, as doubt begins to linger, that through the power of your resurrection, you would sustain them, you would hold them, and you would keep them faithful unto death. And that at the right time, they would emerge out of the season of suffering to the place of great gospel impact, of sanctification, more like Jesus. And Father, may we all this week take some time to reflect on how committed we are to this gospel. Thank you for facing the suffering, the ultimate suffering for us, Jesus, because that suffering we could have never endured. But that one you beat for us. So now we can be victorious in what we face. We're thankful for that, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you'd like to take a next step with Redemption Church, visit us online at experienceredemption.com slash connect card. You can also give online to support the work of Redemption Church. To explore your giving options, visit experienceredemption.com slash give online. We hope that the message you heard today encouraged you. See you again soon.